Alrighty, so I'm here to talk about Postgres and HA specifically, um, and how do you do high availability across geo regions um, using console. It's an, about myself, Sean Chittenden, I work for HashiCorp. Um, what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is an open source tool. It's, I believe, MPL v2, so um, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I've been working with Postgres uh, for know, 14, 15 years now. So I'm gonna start this presentation with a quick demo. We're going to, um, in your mind, please create the following visualization. We're going to have a Postgres leader and uh, several followers in one data center, and we're going to have a remote data center, DC2. I believe in this, it's actually called Lab2. Um, we're gonna have a follower in a remote data center, and we are going to fail over using DNS-based failover to a remote data center. So the first thing I want to show is we have three followers, and I've got three different, or four different different terminals here, each representing one, uh, the servers from the previous slide, uh, screens one through four. So the first thing here is we've got our um, leader on our slaves here, our mass ugh, followers. Um, we have a... There we go. We have a DNS entry, dynamic DNS entry. You can see that there are two hosts listed in that. We can go over to the other boxes and see that they are, um, oops. Let's see. Um, give me a second. We have Postgres running here at PDRAP. And uh, there we go, okay, so, and on our fourth box in the remote data center, we have also Postgres running. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slowly start shutting these boxes down, or these Postgres instances down. And we should see that one of those um, entries disappeared because it went away we're gonna do the same thing here. And assuming I didn't actually break things, woohoo! I did fix the demo right before this. Um, the failover happened, and this IP address is the IP address in the remote data center. So if I bring this, all this information, or bring this service back up, we should see that it begin, it fails back over to its local data center, and then if I bring up that third instance and fully restore health of the environment, we should see that second entry show up there. Okay, are there any questions about what I just showed or demoed there? Does this make sense? Great, okay. So this is a, 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 an important technique um, using dynamic DNS uh, the dynamic DNS is provided by an open source tool called Console. Console does service discovery. It provides an HTTP interface into its distributed state store. It provides a DNS interface, which is what we're going to be talking about mostly today. It is multi-data center aware, and it performs health checks. So when you install Console, um, that does use agents on each of those boxes. Um, the um, console tool actually exists a part of a slightly larger ecosystem that I'm not going to be talking about much today, um, but it does exist and handle most of the runtime operational aspects of a dynamic infrastructure. So there's a couple terms that I'm gonna cover. The first one is, is an agent. What is an agent? In a distributed network, you have clients and you have servers. Console is written in Go. We have a single binary. We distribute that binary. That binary acts as both the command line interface and the agent for the clients and the agent for the servers. When I'm talking about an agent, I am referring to an endpoint in the console network. Clients are um, the recipients of instructions and they push information to servers. Servers maintain the distributed state store and 
we have this co concept of consensus. We have a data center-wide um, view of the world that is coherent. All agents participate in gossip. What I mean by gossip is an application-level protocol ping that goes between agents. This includes co console servers and console agents. And then we have a data center. And this is conceptually the equivalent of a, a domain or scoped uh, view of the world. So console is a, a pretty opinionated framework. It has a strong under, uh, understanding or belief in the way that things are supposed to be run. And if you work within that framework, you will receive a, uh, a, a set of benefits that come from this, this structure. So one of those things is, is that all agents inside of a given data center must be able to communicate with each other. In doing so, we get very good, scalable health detection. Um, we believe that whatever this concept is in a distributed environment needs to be very simple to administrate. Um, and that you will see in the configuration. And it needs to be able to be, the, the tool needs to be composable and useful with other, um, other tools in an ecosystem, and both the HashiCorp ecosystem and other tooling. So what does this actually look like? So what you see here is we've got a bunch of clients. All clients there are gossiping between each other. All clients actually can gossip between the servers. The, the, the graph or the visualization here is, is I'm going to say, not, uh, it, it just omitted the gossip between all the servers. The servers self-elect a leader. So unlike Postgres, where you have servers and you have a designated master and fail over between masters or between um, uh, leaders and followers, it's going to take a long time to unwind that muscle memory. Um, between the the, uh, the these uh, servers, will self-elect a leader, um, and that happens um, completely without any administrative intervention assuming there is quorum. So in a single data center environment, when a client needs to go and look up a piece of information, it, it dispatches an RPC to one of the servers. Servers will forward that information amongst each other as necessary in order to talk to the leader. And then the leader will return back the response to the client. And the client at that point in time will, will translate that information as a DNS response or as an HTTP response back to some um, application. So when I mentioned earlier that console was multi-data center aware, it takes this exact same um, pr set of principles in the form of uh, gossip, except for it extends the timeline or the timeout values between the different data centers. And uh, all, what this means is all servers across multiple data centers participate in this WAN gossip where on the land side of things, gossip happens uh, and has very short timeouts that are appropriate for land environments. The WAN gossip is uh, significantly more relaxed. So when you have a client that has a question now in a multi-data center environment, the client issues an RPC request, talks to a server. The server, um, at that point in time, knows of other data centers. It relays that RPC request to any other server in the remote data center. The servers in the remote data center then will forward as necessary and then perform the appropriate lookup, and then it returns back the response. So then the client will see, has a, uh, only has to be aware of its local servers, but then it, you now have the ability to have a lookup mechanism that spans multiple facilities, potentially physical facilities. So, are there any other questions about multi-data center? I'm going to stop and pause as we go through, because one of the things that we're going to begin talking about here is, is distributed systems, effectively, that we are using to wrap Postgres as a service for our organization. So some of this is going to be Postgres-specific. Some of it's going to be a departure. OK. So one of the important things that I mentioned there was the ability to have um, the servers self-elect. And there, earlier today, there was a I talk about PG Paxos. Um, there is another um, different algorithm in the um, academic world called Raft um, that handles distributed consensus. Raft is a, um, a distributed state machine, effectively. So I'm going to let this play. This is a visualization. There's, um, it's a phenomenal visual visualization tool because you can actually interact with it. 
So what we're seeing right here is we're seeing five, five servers. There are no leaders at this point in time. The simulation just began. So what we're going to see here is S3, server 3, received its, um, server 3 was the first server to time out, and it sent messages to all of the other nodes, uh, server nodes in the cluster. All of the other nodes responded back with a message. Server 3 ended up with enough votes, and it became the leader. This is how the raft or the, the console servers self-elect. And so we can see that as writes happen to the leader, the followers pick up these changes and catch up. These heartbeats happen very aggressively. Uh, there is a message sent out on demand. One of the things that is nice about the raft environment or um, protocol is that it is effectively self-healing. So we're going to see here in a second that some other node is going to pick up, most likely at server 5. There we go. And it's going to become the leader there. You can see at some point in the future, server 3 is going to um, come back online, and its log will catch up. So this is a really important aspect of console because in a dynamic environment, you need to have something that is resilient. In a set it and forget it static world, a lot of these properties don't exist. You can send something off to a static IP address, um, and you can be guaranteed that as long as that other endpoint is up. Well, in a more dynamic world, you need something that's, that's responsive on a machine time scale not a human time scale if you're interested in high availability. So there's lots of neat things that can be done here. Um, this is a very helpful under, a way of, of visualizing things and being able to interact with a cluster without actually going off and breaking things either in VMs or in production. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to point out and why this is a really important thing to have settled in everybody's mind is this changes the way administration needs to happen of this piece of infrastructure in the sense that you can't go and shut down all five boxes or you can't shut down three boxes even. Right? You have to maintain quorum at all times. Right? Really important property of console is, and just distributed, distributed systems in general is if you end up in a situation where you are in the minority and you do not have quorum, rights will stop making forward progress. My rights to server two there are going to time out and not succeed because there is not another leader, or there's not quorum. And you can see there that, that uh, it attempted to grab leadership. It failed to do so and had to increment. So we'll get into potentially some of those details later. All right, so console does a, provides a, a number of services. Um, it provides a DNS interface. It provides an HTTP interface. This is what you see and experience on the, the client side of things. There is a gossip protocol. There is a WAN gossip protocol. Um, and then you have all of, obviously, the RPC interfaces that go back and forth between clients and servers. So there's a large number of, of network ports that are available, uh, that are in use by console doing different things. Um, so if, as people go to deploy and use this, uh, be aware of some of the firewall constraints that are required. Um, it's pretty simple in the sense that client to server um, you only have to worry about RPCs and LAN gossip. Uh, servers have a slightly larger surface area because they're involved in mul more network activities. So the, I'm going to skip this. So on the server side of things, when we have this distributed state machine, the catalog on the servers are m managed and replicated across all nodes. And that's what we really kind of care about, is how does that information uh, replicated so that as 
a request to come in for who's the leader, then the console servers are able to respond to that in you know, various uh, potential failure situations. So failover D via DNS is fantastic, but it's not uh, a free solution. Um, it is very nice in LAN environments because it works across L3 boundaries. Um, keep alive D, VRP, CARP, whatever your you know, poison of choice is for layer two networks, um, those types of technologies are great until they're not, and you need to potentially span, your, um, let's say, multiple racks that have different subnets. So if you wanted to, to have failover in a LAN environment, you need to use something that's slightly higher level. You can use a load balancer, which is a bump in the wire type device, or you can talk directly to an IP endpoint. But in order to have something that's adaptive, you need to have some mode of indirection. DNS is a very lightweight, completely ubiquitous protocol that actually satisfies that workload. So, um, and this is also particularly nice because clients can cache this information. DNS is a well-known animal. It's been around for a very long time. It is not without its problems, but it is also not subject to some of the other more pathological problems that you can have with lower level uh, solutions like uh, IP stealing. Um, specifically, spanning tree, not a problem. Multi-master, you don't have to worry about that where on the network layer you have split brain. Um, but the, the, the problems are not entirely small in the sense that um, when you have an established connection and you conduct a failover, you need to go through and kill off all the old TCP connections in order to have all of your clients perform a lookup again and connect to the, right, to the correct IP address, which is now the new leader. Um, so even while well, caching is, is both a benefit, it is also a problem. So there's a couple of techniques for, for mitigating that. Um, most notably using short TTLs. So what does it look like to do an installation? Um, simplicity is really important, especially for, um, especially for distributed systems. Uh, there's a number of, of config line elements here. Um, the most important parts, this is a default deny configuration. Um, the out of the box experience for console is a default allow. This is an important thing to know as, as you go into production. Um, so there's a handful of tunables that need to be set. But the most important part here that I wanted to point out is the bootstrap expect. When you start up a console server, it expects that it's going to have a total of three nodes in the environment. Um, it's going to expect that you have a data directory where it's able to write out its stateful information. And you need to spe specify some form of a policy with regards to how long you wanna have your DNS entries, um, what the TTL is going to be for your DNS entries. In this particular config, you can see that service TTL is set to a five second um, TTL for everything, but it, let's say you have one particular service in your environment called stable service, you can override the default five second TTL and specify in this case one day. Um, running it from the command line is very also similarly simple in the sense that you say console agent, you pass off a config file that I just showed you, and then a config directory, and I'll explain what goes in there um, in just a second because we're going to put a Postgres service in there. Um, so once you have this up and running, you start your, your first node, in this case VM1. It says that, hey, I'm alive, but it doesn't have quorum, and it won't until it learns about its neighbors. So when you start up a node, um, for the first time, you have to join the, the, this node that's sitting there that needs to participate in a, a console network. It's, in, it's completely isolated because it doesn't know what other IP addresses it needs to talk to. So if for bootstrapping, you have to tell it, please go and, and join this console cluster um, and join these two other nodes. And as soon as you join these two nodes, then all of a sudden you've created the basic of, basis of a console cluster, and they will begin heart beating and talking amongst each other. So when you put something into production like this, the um, information about the state of the world is really important, console info, the command line interface provides a good uh, um, set of information. In this case, you can see that as soon as we started up um, and joined, there was a leader that was self-elected. In this case, it's, it's dot .139. Um, between all of the nodes there, there is a heartbeat that happens, and let's see, I was looking for the, 
Let's turn the next one. Um, so you can see that there are a total of two servers um, and that the local state is in that follower state. So how do you config up then clients in order to use this, this, this console infrastructure that you now have? So um, it is a common and uh, typically recommended even um, configuration to use a local DNS cache. Um, in this case, uh, DNS mask, specify run on port 53. Everything in the dot console TLD will forward to the console agent on the local box. If you look back here on the ports, remember there is a console interface running on TCP and UDP port 8600. And so if you point DNS mask 127.0.0.1 to um, local loopback port 8600, it will find all of your servers for you, which means that in your DNS mask configs, you're able to provide a, a static IP address. And this is a, an important thing because it means that all of your configuration files are the same. You can just rubber stamp this stuff out. And even though you're in this dynamic environment, the console clients will figure out what servers to go talk to for you so you don't have to do anything on your uh, remote nodes or on your, or on your console nodes. Um, so we can do reverse DNS here so we can look things up and it'll forward as necessary. And instead of, in, in this example I used, um, open DNS is uh, for uh, recursive servers, you may want to have those point to your actual you know, bind servers for your particular infrastructure. And then in your, your resolve conf, you just say, hey, pass through 127.0.0.1. And this is really nice because if there's any kind of a bump, your local client will query the DNS server locally and you avoid that trip to the network. So what happens um, in order to present this interface is, is there is a service discovery framework that's built into console. Um, in order to make use of the service discovery interface, you need to specify a config file that tells console that you have something. In this case, we've created a um, config file or a service called pgdb. We tag it as a follower. We pass in a health check, and we put it in this configd directory that I specified earlier when we ran the agent. Hup console uh, on the agent side of things, on the client side of things, and it will propagate this information out to the rest of the console cluster. So. This is reasonably simple. The script there is, um, obeys a Nagios check-like protocol, exit zero, and the service is healthy. Um, exit uh, two, and it, it marks it as critical, and it will withdraw it from the, um, with, from, from the service discovery network. So what does this look like? Well, when I said that the console is opinionated, it's because it prescribes a particular structure to the way that you should go and find assets inside of your network or services inside of your network. So in this case, we have follower.pgdb.service.console, and this will provide you an A record response that tells you, hey, I've got something at this particular IP address. That's great and all, um, but in more densely packed environments, you may want to actually provision uh, Postgres or other services running on non-standard ports, and console supports SRV, where it passed back the port number 5432. So if you have applications that do support the SRV lookup, um, this will all just kind of magically work out of the box. So the intention here is, is that it's, it's DNS is, is basically zero touch. Every application in the universe knows how to speak DNS. Um, because DNS acts as this nice abstraction um, or layer of indirection, um, console can provide some additional benefit there. So it'll provide DNS round robin for you. Um, or randomized DNS round robin. And what this does is, is particular for slaves um, or followers, it will provide a way of performing workload distribution. And because it's distributing this workload for you now, potentially across all of the followers, the, um, you can take nodes in and out of rotation, and you don't have to coordinate that across teams, potentially. Um, it, it's, it's intended to be very, very you know, lightweight and easy to integrate into both applications and organizations. Um, and then there's, you know, if, if you need a more rich API, there's an HTTP interface that allows for higher level um, integrations. Um, a lot of the uh, console ecosystem um, makes use of this. So health checks, you don't want to have something come back, or you don't want to have a response come back to something that's potentially you know, three days, or serving data that's three days old. 
So the, the, what's a health check, um, or what's that protocol again? If it exit, if the check returns exit zero, it will um, exit zero. It'll it'll mark the thing. Uh, the, the service is healthy. Warning uh, one, and anything else is actually considered failing. So one of the things that's that's particularly nice about this is um, it's quite scalable because the console event model is edge triggered. So you can run checks on both the host as well as on the service themselves. So if you wanted to fail all services on a particular database, let's say you, you've, you've got a multi-tenant type environment where you're running multiple copies of Postgres on a single box, you can have some form of a health check that covers all services on a particular node. Uh, be semi-careful with some of this stuff. Be, you don't want to use this for um, ad hoc, you know, hey, this is a, a warning. You, you want it to err on the side of black and white. The service is up, or this host is up or down, or this service is up or down, not, I think this service might be getting slower. This, this server's looking like it may be um, getting bogged down, but um, using something like a mem check, maybe load check would be a much better one. If my load average is over 1,000, yeah, I probably don't want to be doing anything. But you don't want to do anything where it's like load average of five, I'm busy, you know, take me out. No, just be careful. Um, there are other types of checks. So if you have an HTTP service locally, um, you can also perform an HTTP check. And this works without doing fork exec. So if you have a resonant process that you want to communicate with over HTTP, this is a good thing. So because it, or because console is edge triggered, it's actually quite scalable. In traditional um, Nagios style health checking w frameworks, you have a health checking service, and, and it goes and sends off a ping and says, hey, DB1, are you healthy? And it says, yes, I am. And then it keeps going down the line, and it, there's a scheduler on this, uh, on the health checking service, and it goes through you know, as fast as it can, and it gets to you know, some DBN or DB1000, whatever, and it says, no, I'm not healthy. But what this you know, the, this particular structure architecture means that health checking, this, this health checking service is, ha, is a single point of failure, and you're dealing with thousands of requests hitting a particular um, endpoint, potentially. And that's less than ideal. Console does this differently um, in that you, it, console will run its checks continuously. Um, you saw earlier that the interval that I specified was 10 seconds. It's actually very common to run those checks at one second intervals in order to provide a very high degree of, of freshness to that data. And then only report out or trap out whenever there is a state change. So in effect, this takes your thousands of requests per second that you had to scale to handle earlier down to maybe tens of requests a second in a bad day, right? Again, only mes messages sent back to retract something only happen uh, on failure, whenever there's a state change. And the reason this is possible is because I mentioned gossip earlier. It doesn't need to, um, console doesn't need to know that a node is alive at the health checking layer, because on a lower layer, there is this gossip protocol that is running continuously. So the gossip layer provides a, a, a low level safety net that says all of the nodes in my network are alive. So the way that, that this is actually implemented is, is when I mentioned that it was a, an application level ping, it sends something out over UDP, it, an application level ping over UDP to a cross section of hosts. So it'll take the entire list of servers, grabs five of them, sends off a heartbeat message every 100 milliseconds, waits for a response. If it doesn't get one back because it is UDP, then it will go and perform an indirect ping, and it'll talk to one of its neighbors and it says, hey, neighbor, can you go and ping, ser or like neighbor B, can you go ping server A, or node A, I wasn't able to reach it. And if node B can, then it'll say, okay, false alarm, right? This, this other node refuted death. What this also gives us is a constant load on the network that provides a high level of, uh, of uh, high, high level of certainty with regards to the accuracy of the information. Um, and, and that's really nice. So because we have this, this gossip layer, we don't have to constantly heartbeat at the health check layer because we're doing it at the gossip layer. So what does this look like? There we go. OK. So 
in this particular environment, I've got two data centers. I have a lab one uh, data center, and it has a single instance. In this case, it is uh, MyDB. And you can see that I've got um, two services here in the um, healthy state. And I'm going to go shut down one of those. And this information propagates very, very quickly. Because I've got that polling health check running once a second, great, it ran once a second, and it updated that once a second because it instantly went to a failing state. So we can see that. And if you want to know why, that information is, uh, uh, there we go, yeah. Um, we have some understanding from the UI dashboard here why exactly we couldn't get to that particular node. In this case, it just flat out couldn't connect. Bring that back up. And that host is back in the rotation. So pretty convenient. And on the network side of things, I need to go change this back in a second. Huh? That's right. We'll move on. So there's a key value interface as well. This is important for just storing runtime configuration information if, if necessary, putting um, data such as um, hosts that are allowed to talk for like PGHBA conf. Um, this is a good place to go store that, who's allowed to talk to what you can actually do. So you can see here, we stored a value uh, bar at the key foo. And there's a series of metadata information there. Uh, this is base64 encoded so that you can store binary information. Uh, please keep requests under 500k in size. Um, now, console does ship in a um, allow by default type config. Because you don't want to allow random um, administrators or teams to potentially register a um, non-authentic service at the address mydb, um, dot service dot console. You want to also provide a deny by default type config that allows everybody to query, um, but then also um, allows administrators to deploy services as they want. DNS does not allow you to pass in an authentication token, so you have to set up the anonymous token um, in order to allow reads from DNS servers. So in this case, we say that the empty service allows, uh, which match its prefix match, allows everybody to query that service. And that's the most important part of this. So how do we do the geo component of geo failover using console? So we've got this, this network gossip layer. And that actually provides us with um, a, a concept of network latency or network distance. And um, that's neat. We want to incorporate that into our model of the world. In our world, we have multiple data centers, and we want to allow our clients to talk to any service that claims to be authentic, um, potentially spread across multiple data centers. These policies can potentially change, and we don't want to make um, the clients aware of the details. We just want to present a consistent interface so that across organizational boundaries, we don't have to worry about communicating this to a large number of teams. Um, I have my DB, and maybe I'm going to move it from DC1 to DC2, and the rest of the world should not be aware or really involved in that beyond potentially an FYI. So how do we handle this? Well, in the case of console, we provide a query namespace, which is similar to a service. A service was a very static kind of uh, definition in the sense that a, um, you register something on, on the client, and the client reflects that information out to the catalog on the servers. Um, prepared queries allow the servers to perform some level of intelligence on whatever the, the state of the information is in the catalog. So um, because this, this is no longer a simple lookup and there's actually some potential calculation involved, we have a new um, domain query.console that allows for uh, DNS lookups to run prepared queries. And by using this new subdomain, basically magic happens. So what does a prepared query look like in the case of, of console? So you specify a name for prepared query. In this case, it's, it's GOPGDB follower. 
and it's going to look for a service. It's, it's effectively a filter. In the sense, it's going to look for a service called PGDB. It's going to look in the nearest three data centers for if it can't find it locally. And it's going to look for services that have been tagged as follower. And then I can go and perform this lookup, and that'll just magically work. But having to specify that for every single instance is kind of tedious, so we wanted to provide a generic interface that allows a kind of ubiquitous safety net to exist. And so we have prepared query templates. So for a Postgres instance here, we would have something in the effect of like, uh, the name is, is now just an identifier. It's not used in any real capacity. The regex is actually what's used. It, regex has to be anchored. In this case, we, we're looking for two things that are hyphen separated. The first thing is the database name, and the second thing is the tag. What we do then is we resolve that into, we take the matches from that, and we search for uh, a service, which is PG dash, uh, whatever that is, and we look in the nearest data centers. Um, you can explicitly const constrain the list of data centers here. Um, instead of using just nearest n, it'll look for the nearest three data centers in the following two. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but if you had, imagine, you know, DC 1, 2, 3, 4, and you wanted to have it only look inside of those four, it would find and search only inside of three. And then it matches the tags based off of what was passed in. And this is nice and flexible because under the hood, you can have Geo, uh, GeoDB billing follower um, and then let's say in the future that follower ends up like you have a Hadoop cluster that, that gets spun up and it wants to scoop all of your data and you want to spin up a new database instance that is going to be specific for um, OL, um, OLAP type queries, sorry, um, then you could potentially go and tag a particular database, not as follower, maybe you would tag it as OLAP and all of a sudden you didn't have to go do any administration to go set that up, GeoDB billing um, OLAP would just show up in, in the queries and uh, re D DNS requests would route to the right database instance. And then if you wanted just kind of a, a, a completely ubiquitous um, safety net, there's also the empty template which will match everything. So if you look inside of data center one for any kind of prepared query, it'll look inside of all of the other console data centers to go find and resolve that. So what's this doing under the hood? It's, what am I doing here for time? Um, what's it doing under, uh, under the hood is it's, um, it's using this gossip layer that we talked about briefly in order to build out a network map of distances or, or network tomography. Um, and so as it develops this, this model of where all of the servers exist in the network, it can actually figure out, and you can now use this information to perform calculations that say, hey, give me the approximate round trip time between node Z and node X. And it can do that even though you're on node A. Um, it's very interesting stuff, um, and it provides with a, a, a really kind of um, neat way of, of both seeing the world from, and being able to, to query and do things very dynamically. So you now have network locality that you can actually rely on. So what does console do? Um, service discovery provides health checks, data center aware, and you can store runtime type configuration information there. Um, there is an ecosystem of other tools and components that you can um, integrate. There's lots of, of kind of standalone utilities that, that act as the clients. So for as, as an administrator, if you wanted to go figure some of this stuff out, um, or it, to, if you as an administrator wanted to just kind of plumb some stuff together, you can. Um, I would recommend looking at console template and env console um, because they are particularly easy to integrate into console, no coding involved. Um, and I'm gonna go to questions now. I have a demo and I can get into more specifics um, with the environment that I have set up if there were. How are we doing? Go ahead. So in, yeah, so, uh, let's see, in, what does it look like here? In this particular case, you would see VMs one through three, because they're all three of those console servers, they would just go offline. Um, and you would see from the command line here, uh, oops, da -da -da, console members, you would see them in this, um, I had to, modify my environment right before the demo here. And so I, I forcefully left VM 
three. But what you would see here is you would see, um, actually, let me just do this. You'll see that it's alive, and then all of a sudden it will change to a failed state. And so you'll be in this situation where you will see, you know, all of your, everything that's participating in that data center going dark. Uh, and, and it will look in this failed state. Um, the most, the, 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 con the thing that I mentioned earlier of, um, Oh yeah, the quorum moves all. Uh, quorum shouldn't change. Uh, quorum won't change because if you have three agents that are coming up, or let's say five agents in it, um, and it will it says I need to talk to at least three other servers in order to establish quorum, and then it will begin an election cycle. So it actually will recover in those situations. Um, but during that period of time, while that's all happening. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Correct. So I didn't, I, yes, let me touch on that because that's a really important thing. The state transition of, of Postgres is not managed by console. The advertisement of which Postgres instance in what state is advertised through console. There are other software projects, there's going to be a talk tomorrow by Josh Burkus, where he's going to be talking about how to do the automatic failover. Um, this type of a system and that type of a system will work very, 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 very well together. Um, because it allows, uh, it allows for the automatic kind of failover, fail back, um, and then to have that information reflected out over some form of the service discovery. Other questions? Oh, go ahead, How Anders. So I have working on a module called uh, PG Console that will actually take the list of running databases and then register that out automatically with the console network. So as an administrator, it becomes basically zero touch. You do you know create extension PG Console, pass out a, a couple of parameters into that, and then all nodes will have. Or are they, all, all of the databases local in a box will, will have that information. This is why I was asking about the C++ uh, free hook yesterday, actually. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's, um, that would be very, I think, I think as, as somebody coming from a, an environment where there was lots of Postgres um, in a prior life, uh, this would have been a big deal. Um, because then I could have had hundreds or thousands of database instances, and as an administrator, I wouldn't have to integrate it with anything. I'd just go create database, whatever, and it would just show up. And if, as an administrator, I did some failover maintenance, um, one of the things that I didn't talk um, at length here about, let me go back up to this slide here, um, is, remember I mentioned there's tags? So in this case, I've got the tag follower.pgdb. You can change the tag based off of the state of the Postgres instance. I want that to happen automatically, right, in order to not have a static file. And so you can do that through the HTTP interface. Um, and so I want the PG console, you know, extension to go do that for me so that as, as an administrator, I can go and fail over, from, uh, fail over between two different instances. And the, 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 my administrative actions are automatically reflected out to all of my applications that are consuming my service. So in that regard, it, it would be a big deal for administrators to be able to have that because now you have the um, you know, Conway's law, you have different organizations and responsibilities, and I've just made the friction between those two organiza or organizations or, or departments inside of a company um, basically go to zero. Um, right now, I ask that one more time. Make sure. And I. Yes. Yep. Um, I I think it would be for taking off every hat as an as a Postgres. So the question was: Is should service discovery be something that's a part of like Postgres contrib? Um, or just kind of some external module. Uh, having 
worked with Postgres in, in large in environments with lots of different teams. I think that it would be a good thing for Postgres to have something um, I, in as far as service discovery, and I think it would be nice if there, or, and important for um, organizations or people adopting and using Postgres in larger environments to have that out of the box experience. And if that ever happened, then maybe I need to move away from C++ for a PG console. <laughs> I, I thought that was where you were going. All right, other questions? All right, thank you very much. If there are questions, please feel free to stop by and uh, hit me up offline. Uh, there you go, thank you very much. <laughs>